Welcome to The Thriving Marriage, the podcast for those who want to get their spouse back in love with them and truly thrive. You'll learn why 95% of people don't save their marriage and the secret method no one else is talking about that will change everything for you. Are you ready? 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 Let's Let's turn turn tragedy tragedy to triumph. triumph. Here are your hosts, international marriage experts, Mark Johnston and Heather Choate. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Thriving Marriage Podcast. My name is Mark Johnston. I'm the uh, head marriage expert uh, with High Thrive Coaching. Uh, Today, we are going to be discussing, well, all of <laughs> We're going to be discussing the questions that you've an- asked all of us. Um, so we have been listening. We've been going through and looking at the messages that you've been putting uh, into the, the Facebook group here and into other places, the, the ones that you've been emailing us. And today I want to answer many of those questions for you. So uh, we have just mainly been looking at, okay, what are the most common ones? What are the ones that we feel like really need to be answered and we're going to get through as many of those as possible today now of course uh, a lot of this a lot of this um we we do go over in depth in in the courses and whatnot that we uh that that we offer here and i will be talking a little bit about that uh, a bit later today um so why don't we just go ahead and jump right in uh so (laughs) I'm just going to start firing off some questions and we'll we'll get into that. So first question, is there hope if it's been 18 months and no change? Um, Alicia here says that there wasn't an affair or abuse. He just quit. So a situation like this, 18 months and no change, it really does depend on uh, on the situation. Now, I do see... uh, in many cases that even after a long time there can be a a big shift in in the relationship Uh, what tends to to make that shift though is uh, there needs to be a lot of consistency there needs to be some big changes there you know you know alicia here talks about how her husband just quit but there are reasons why he just quit uh, you know, this would depend a lot on whether he just quit because there is a lack of love or because there has been a lot of arguing and tension, uh, whether they just, he feels like there's just nothing in common anymore. But uh, essentially, if you can ad- actually address some of those concerns and problems, it makes a huge difference. Uh, I will say that with a lot of time past, you know, 18 months, I uh, people do tend to get into certain routines and they get used to the way thing, things are. And for Alicia's husband to actually consider a change uh, or to consider a, a different option, there would actually have to be a reason to reconsider what he's doing. Uh, so sometimes I will discuss with clients uh, providing like a shock to the system or, you know, providing that big change themselves. Uh, I, I see this almost in very similar ways to say something like a, a, a substance abuse or addiction, substance dependence, where you know the the person who is dealing with like a, a drug problem, they there does need to be something to force them to reconsider their current course of action. You know, using drugs, not doing anything about it. Uh, the, the same sort of thing here. You know. And, my experience when I did work with people uh, with uh, with substance abuse problems, they, they tended to need uh, to have to hit like a rock bottom, or they tended to need a reason to reconsider. So the same sort of thing here. Even if your spouse has been distant or cold for a long period of time, if there is sufficient reason to reconsider what's going on then that's going to be something that's going to really make that change a lot easier. Some examples of this, um, let's pretend that, you know, because I don't have Alicia's full story here, let's pretend that, um, you know, nothing changing means that her husband is still in the house and they just aren't doing anything. Uh, You know, so a big shift here might be if Alicia is threatening 
separation or divorce. Or if, uh, you know, another situation might be if her husband starts to recognize the effect that the marriage problems are having on the children, or it starts to impact his personal life in some way, or, you know, any number of things that really provide motivation. Uh, we, of course, um, in our, <laughs> in, in the, some of the courses that we offer, I do have a, a very in-depth training on building motivation and discovering what would be motivating for a spouse, especially one who is ch more checked out and just a bit more apathetic rather than anything else. All right, next question. Um, it says, you know, we're in the final stages of separation and this person, Sarah, is, uh, you know, trying to, to stall a bit. She hasn't given up yet. But what are some signs that she might notice to say that he's he's shifting or starting to pay attention or starting to, to make some changes? I think the biggest uh, sign in these sort of situations um, is especially when uh, the, the spouse who is pulling away from the marriage, when they start to change how they describe what's going on. So you'll, you'll see this uh, in when, they, when they're starting to engage in separation, when there's affairs going on, they have to justify their actions. They have to say, um, okay, well, I'm, I'm leaving because my, my husband or my wife is abusive or they, they don't care about me at all or they, they're a terrible father or mother. Uh, they, they might have other reasons that they, they're putting out there. Um, but in general, a lot of these are uh, negative attri attributions towards you, uh, the, the person who's trying to, to fix the, the, the marriage. And you'll know that it's starting to turn around when, uh, when they start describing the situation differently, when they start saying, you know what, maybe uh, it's not all your fault. Or when they start saying, uh, you know, I, I could have done better here or even even better when they say you know i can see that you really tried hard they even <laughs> they start describing you in positive terms the the big uh problem that happens there is as the separation starts to to grow <laughs> as it starts to grow there there's almost invariably some amount of contempt that starts to set in a, a negative view a persistent negative view of you or the relationship. And uh, it, it's that that really prevents a lot of, um, you know, it, it prevents the spouse who's pulling away from really even considering uh, other options. They're, they're really trying to reinforce their decision to leave because it's a difficult decision. They need to make it feel okay. And so when they start to question that when they start to say, you know what, my husband, my wife really wasn't that bad of a person, uh, you know, and I, I myself contributed to the problem. When they start actually taking some responsibility and feeling like they could have affected it differently, that's when you know that uh, things are starting to shift and that things are starting to get better. Okay. Uh, I think I see another question here from Yulia. Uh, very similar question. What are the signs that the, the change the narrative approach worked and how do I get to the point of discussing commitment? And the only reason I in, I'm including this one is it does have a, a slightly different uh, question in here right, in shifting it towards commitment. The, uh, much like I was talking about with the last question with Sarah, um, changing the image or changing the narrative, you can really tell if that's working if they are starting to describe you or the relationship differently. Uh, the shift here then, you know, because there's this, there's this kind of gray area where uh, the person is not, is starting to look at the situation differently but they haven't quite committed to the relationship yet. They might be lingering around a bit more. They might be talking with you more in depth. They might be spending more time with you. Uh, perhaps 
maybe physical intimacy is resumed, even if the emotional connection isn't quite there. Uh, but, you know, you still don't have that commitment. Uh, so this is kind of the, this gray area where the, the person is not, uh, the person pulling away from the marriage is still not quite sure what to do. They have this very negative view. They're seeing changes and they're starting to describe you differently, the, the marriage differently. And, um, but they're not ready to fully commit because it's still a risky proposition. It's still represents this risk where they could get hurt if they were to jump all in. Uh, my typical suggestion with a th this gray area right here um, is to really take away any sort of pressure towards big jumps in commitment. Uh, you know, you don't want to take a person who's in this sort of space and say, okay, you need to uh, commit to the marriage 100%. I, I don't think, you know, I don't think they're quite ready for that at that point. They will let you know when they are. Um, but I think you can more easily be, uh, you can ask them for some small amounts of commitment, things that are easier to say yes to and put limits on that. So for instance, if you are saying, hey, you know, this doesn't have to mean that we're getting back together, but I would just like to, to come and have a chat with you for a little while. Just, you know, it's at least ha have some good communication, you know, committing to communication, committing to being able to spend time together, um, you know, committing to being a little bit more open with how you feel or to resolving conflict. I, uh, you know, if you're able to get them to agree to working a little bit on the relationship, you know, I wouldn't even put it like that, you know, it, it's very much apply it to what they, they want solved, but getting them to work on something really allows you to then make further steps. But, you know, keep the commitment small when your partner is hesitant. Same sort of situation when you are first starting to uh, develop a new relationship. You don't go from, you know, a second or third date to saying, okay, I think we should get married now. It wouldn't make sense because the person isn't really sure if they can give you that much commitment. Same sort of thing here is you do need to build up that commitment a little bit more slowly. Now, it's different from a new relationship because, you know, there, there's usually going to be a tipping point where you, the, the reluctant spouse will allow a big jump in commitment, but you let them kind of do that themselves. All right, next question. Catherine said, asks, how can I make my cold, distant husband feel emotionally and physically attracted to me again? How can I make him see that I exist? I included this question because I'm, I know a lot of people are wondering very similar things. Here we have a very distant spouse and there's just a, a deep craving for some connection, for some acceptance, wanting to feel wanted again. Um, and this is a complicated question to, to answer because there's many uh, many factors that could frustrate this or could um, provide for some obstacles. But the, the general principle here is, you know, I'm, I'm assuming that this question that there isn't really any uh, explicit or direct desire to pull away from the relationship. We just have maybe perhaps a cold or distant spouse, someone who uh, perhaps is still in the, the relationship, just not working on the relationship or really putting much effort into the relationship. Um, my, my guess here, in many cases like this, <clears throat> is that there hasn't really been much, uh, much of a focus on the relationship at all. Uh, this is, you know, quite free, uh, quite common, especially in relationships that, um, you know, when you start to have children, 
and you start to get more invested in your career uh, and you start to um, you know kind of recognize hey my, my spouse is going to be there I can invest in some of these hobbies and whatnot but you start to put the marriage itself on the back burner and you start to you know the, the marriage as a priority starts to, to go down in your list of priorities I uh, so where do you even start with that um, a big reason why the, the marriage isn't as much as of a priority is it's actually less rewarding uh, to to engage in that relationship is would be my first thought I uh, and so you know the the big thing that you can do with that um, you know if your spouse is unwilling to work on the, the relationship is you need to to make the you know engaging in the the marriage in the relationship much more rewarding. I uh, now th this is I'm giving a very general response because this is a very general answer. Uh, and how you might make the marriage more rewarding is highly dependent on what's missing or what's going on. But I'm just going to guess that um, in this situation, Catherine's husband, uh, there just isn't really a lot of interaction there isn't a lot of warmth there isn't a lot of desire or connection uh, and I I do believe that a lot of times people will respond if you can provide you know a bit of what's wanted so if you're looking for for instance more respect it's very helpful to provide that respect if you're looking for more warmth it's really helpful to provide a bit of that warmth yourself I uh, this may take some time and some effort uh, to, to to get that rolling, um, but you know that would be at least one place to start. If you have good communication, uh, then another place to start it would be to be very direct with these sort of feelings. Um, a good formula that I suggest to my clients is in trying to discuss things like this. You need to ask two questions: How do I feel, and what do I need? Um, and you should discuss those with your husband, Catherine. So if you're saying, I feel lonely and I need some connection, um, you know, I, I would absolutely you know, I, I go to your husband and see if, if there's any willingness to, to go on that. My guess here is that Catherine's husband, there's probably something getting in the way of being able to provide that connection. So you might need to have a discussion about how do we, adjust or how do we uh, um, get around this obstacle so uh, that's where I would start S start to provide more of what you're looking for yourself have a very direct and open conversation um, I you know, a third suggestion would be be ready to um, you know hear some hard truths if there are some things that are blocking some of that connection you know if your husband is feeling hurt or distant there may be a reason for that uh, next question, Shannon asks us, how do you respond when loved ones are trying to be your marriage coach? <laughs> <clears throat> I, I chuckle a little bit of, at this because I, I run into this sort of thing quite a bit. And I will have clients who will come to me and say, you know, that their, their mother, their, uh, their sibling, their whoever, just tells them, oh, just quit, just leave them the be behind, you know, they, they, you're, they're, not, uh, they're not worth it, something along those lines. They're trying to give you advice. Um, my favorite thing to say about this is that, um, you know, the advice that you hear from family and friends, it's really easy for them to give advice like that because they don't have to follow through on it themselves. It's really easy to tell someone else well, you need to stand up for yourself. You need to leave your husband or wife. Uh, you need to tell them, you know, tell them, you know, tell them to their face that that's not okay, or whatever it happens to be, what the whatever the advice happens to be. It's really easy for them to say that because they do not have to do it themselves. Um, it's a very different thing having to actually explore what's going on and why that advice might not be easy. Um, there's a reason why people pay good money for 
professionals like myself to help them in these situations. But how do you deal with these family members? Um, it, that's, I think, more where this question is going, uh, going towards. Uh, you know, how do you deal with family and friends who are trying to give you advice or keep trying to give you advice? Uh, I think you need to, to be very straight with them and talk, tell them about what your intentions are. Uh, I think, you know, if they really care about you, if they really love you, um, you know, if you, you should be able to be direct with them and you should be able to, to let them know, you know, what you are trying to do. So perhaps your mother is telling you to just give up and to not bother anymore. And I, I think if you can let them know just how important it is for you to try to work on the marriage, to to actually make some effort. Uh, this does require for you to be very open with them. For you to say, it's important to me that I work on my marriage. Um, otherwise, you know, I might feel like a, a failure that I didn't try. I, I think just simply uh, letting them know why you can't take that advice and being very open about it is the best path here. Uh, it allows for them, you know, in, in ideal circumstances, you, you know, it allows things to be very clear and it lets them know why you may not be accepting their advice. Um, of course, there might be complications. Maybe they don't want to hear you out or listen, and that's a different situation, but that's where I would start. Um, <clears throat> as we keep going here, uh, Daisy is asking, how can I make him understand my point of view? <laughs> and I I chuckle a little bit at this um, because, I mean, that's, that's what we all want. Um, you know, I, I can even recall last week uh, I was talking with my wife and something had come up and I was, me personally, I was not feeling very well understood myself. It happens. I talk about these sort of relationship issues all the time, but uh, yes, uh, my wife Jen and I, we are, we are human beings. We have, we have arguments, we have moments when we are feeling hurt. Um, and what was interesting about this is um, I, I kept, I, you know, I was telling my wife this. I was saying, I, you know, I'm not feeling hurt. And she was getting upset. Uh, she was feeling attacked uh, and whatnot. And, you know, and we don't need to get into very specific things. But I'm like, here I was, I was trying to be open with her. I was saying, okay, I'm not feeling understood. I need you to understand me. And it wasn't working. Uh, so how did Jen and I, how do we get around this? Uh, um, this happens to be, uh, you know, a theme here in, in many of the situations that I look at, but I stopped focusing so much on my need to feel understood because I could see that my wife also needed to feel understood. And uh, we were able to break the, the tension between us when I offered that understanding myself. I will admit that as I was really trying to push for understanding that I was being very dismissive of you know, what my wife was saying. Like I said, it happens. Uh, you know, my wife, Jen and I, we have young children. We don't always get sleep. Things get in the way. It happens. But it turned around when I started dropping what I needed and started focusing on my wife's need to feel understood. Uh, this, it broke the tension pretty much immediately. And, um, you know, after my wife felt heard, it was much easier for me to uh, ask for some of that understanding as well. Uh, now, this is the very sim simple answer here and there may be many complicating factors that prevent your spouse from hearing you out maybe 
uh, you know, maybe you and your spouse don't have the kind of history that Jen and I have. We, Jen and I, we are used to <laughs> repairing the sort of damage uh, when this comes up. We, we've gained a lot of skills in, in that regard. Or perhaps um, the hurt is running much deeper. Or maybe your spouse is not a very emotionally intelligent sort of person. Maybe their skills lie in other areas. Um, so in those, those sort of cases, it, it is important you know, for you to seek out some professional help if this is getting really serious. But that's where I would start, is start by providing that understanding that you are looking for. And then it becomes much easier to ask for that in return. Uh, we're gonna just keep going. I, I do see a lot of questions here popping into the chat. Um, I'm going to try to get to some of these, and um, I do have a few others in here. I, I have this, honestly, I have a huge list, and we might need to make this more of a regular occurrence. <laughs> but uh, I will try to get to some of the, the the questions in the chat. So if you do have some questions, put it in there, and I'll try to get to that. So. Uh, <coughs> Next question, Jeffrey is asking, my wife is showing two different personalities. One is uh, someone who's feeling weak and fragile, trying to disconnect. The other one is very wild, free, and, and ca not caring. So what is the real person, and how do you connect? Uh, you will, a lot of you will see this sort of thing. You'll see the, the this persona that your spouse uh, adopts as they are pulling away from a marriage. The one that I'm happy, nothing is wrong, everything is absolutely great. And then you'll see these moments when your spouse is breaking down and is feeling like a failure and is, you know, questioning whether this is a good idea or just, you know, struggling with the realities of, say, maybe a separation or a further disconnection. And I want to say that both of these things, you know, for Jeffrey's wife, both of these personalities are the real personality. <laughs> uh, here's the thing about people. People are complicated. I, you know, when I am not at my best, my temper is going to be a little bit shorter. I'm going to be a little bit quicker to raise my voice. Uh, to um, snap at people a little bit. Now, I, I'm generally a very calm person, and uh, you know, I, this doesn't go. I, I'm gonna say, in my defense, I, it, it doesn't go to any point of being damaging or anything. But, but here's here's a, one side of me who is a bit snaps a little bit more, who is a, um, a little bit more prone to see, okay, that people aren't listening to me. You know, my kids aren't are respecting me and I might snap at them and might be a little bit more prone to sending my small children in time out or whatever, instead of really sitting down and listening to them much. But I do have that side as well, where my, my young children could really misbehave and instead of snapping at them, I will sit with them and listen to them and be very gentle with them. So which one of these is the, the real the real mark. Well, they both are, um, and it's important to to recognize where each of these are coming from. You know, I, I very much consider one of my strengths is that I can be a very calm and understanding person, uh, and you know, when I'm at my best, that is really easy for me. At other times, though, when I am snapping, and I'm imagining the same thing here with Jeffrey's wife. When she's not at her best, some of the, these weaknesses come out. Um, it is still important to recognize both sides of this. So in this example, Jeffrey has a wife who is feeling weak and fragile and trying to pull away. Why? What, what would those things be affording her? What would they be giving her to, you know, what would, what would it be providing Jeffrey's wife if she were to pull further away. Uh, a lot of times this drive to disconnect is um, an effort to protect themselves, 
to protect themselves from emotional pain. That needs to be addressed. Uh, the wild, carefree sort of person. If you ignore that side of it as well, you're going to be making a big mistake. Because pulling away may also allow for that wild, carefree sort of attitude. And if you say, no, that's not the real, that, that's not my real wife, um, you're going to be making a mistake as well. So it, it seems to me that Jeffrey's wife really is working towards having that wild, carefree lifestyle. It gives her something or it relieves something, something negative. Maybe it relieves some stress. Maybe it allows her to feel more open, more, you know, maybe, it, it, you know, honestly, it feels good to be more carefree. The other side of her may uh, have some remorse for, uh, you know, failing the marriage, or it may feel, uh, you know, some, some amount of, you know, fragility there uh, and, you know, wanting to feel protected and wanting to feel safe. And if you ignore either side of that, I think you're doing yourself a disservice. The important way to approach this is to just notice what's going on and to have some empathy or understanding. So when, you know, Jeffrey's wife is feeling more weak and fragile and trying to pull away, it's important to be mindful of that. Ask why, try to have that conversation, notice what's going on. And when she is more carefree and a bit more wild, to notice that, like, and kind of under, try to have some understanding for why is she so happy in these moments? If you're trying to come back together, then you need to be able to provide, you know, <laughs> you need to be able to provide some way to support that carefree attitude and to protect against that weak and fragile sort of state. Uh, yeah, <laughs> let's just keep on, on going. Um, I'm going to take a little bit of time here to deviate from my list, and I'm going to start going into uh, questions from the, the chat here. Uh, now, I'm using an app. I'm using what's called Be Live uh, to to to, um, to broadcast onto to Facebook here. So all I'm seeing are <laughs> it just tells me Facebook user, Facebook user, Facebook user, uh, and so I'm not gonna I'm not gonna be able to call it names. But question one here says I'm having a hard time dealing with triggers from our past. What helps getting past this? Uh, that's a really good question because. It, because the a lot of times, you know, when they, there has been a lot of pain, there's bound to be these sort of triggers. We all have triggers. Uh, I have triggers. You know, my wife and I have had a fairly good relationship throughout our, our marriage of 15 years. Um, but I have my own triggers. You know, I me being a very understanding, empathetic person, I listen to people all day. One of my triggers is, you know, I really get bothered when people don't listen to me. And that's, you know, I was talking about a little bit earlier when I tend, you know, to snap a little bit or my temper starts to rise. That's that's going to be one of these triggers. But I imagine that this person is even talking about bigger deals than that. You know, perhaps there has been infidelity. Perhaps there has been some other very painful moment in your relationship that it is highly emotional and stressful. Uh, if we're talking about these very serious issues or even these small issues, I think the, the problem or the solution is very similar. I like to equate this very much to um, the solutions that one might use when dealing with something like PTSD. Which sounds odd, you know, but, you know, it's going to make sense. I mean, it's not just because we, we have the same sort of terminology. We, you know, PTSD has its triggers, and we're talking about emotional triggers here. Um, but uh, a very common uh, method for dealing with PTSD is a branch of cognitive behavioral therapy. It's called narrative therapy. 
Uh, and if you've been listening to us for a long time, you might have heard me mention, um, you know, trying to adjust your spouse's narrative. And these things are a bit related. Um, so in cognitive therapy, there is this concept of, you know, uh, problems uh, due to what are called core beliefs. Um, sometimes we differentiate between core beliefs and intermediate beliefs, or we might also differentiate those uh, in surface level thoughts. But in, in, the, in the theory, we have certain beliefs that we hold on to that, uh, that really shape how we see things. So for instance, if I say to myself that um, everyone, you know, the world is a dangerous place, I'm going to, you know, as I go out and interact with people in the world, I'm going to be much more cautious and much more skeptical. My belief has an effect on how I interact with the world. The same sort of situation happens with triggers. So, you know, in a in a traumatic event that leads to PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, um, one starts to adopt new beliefs. So we might have this sort of belief that adults are going to be mean, you know, if you, if you were abused as a child, uh, or that I can't trust people, I have to be tough to protect myself. We have, there are certain beliefs that happen. Um, you know, I, you know, it, with my own little emotional triggers, I, 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 I kind of come to this sort of conclusion of like people aren't understanding me. People don't, uh, people don't listen to me. You know, things like this. It, it's a, kind of this belief that I kind of battle with in the, the back of my mind sometimes. And these are the moments when I feel a little bit more triggered. So when we're talking about how we deal with triggers, uh, the solution comes to shifting these beliefs. Uh, this is not a simple thing to, to adjust, um, but there is some ability to adjust it with some practice. Uh, we actually, within our uh, training, as some of the trainings that we offer, I have specific exercises for helping you yourself uh, deal with triggers and you know maladaptive beliefs or for supporting your spouse to adjust their own, their own beliefs you know adjusting this narrative and th this is why i call it why it's called narrative therapy is it's much easier to uh, address these beliefs when we put it into a story and as we take a look at our stories our narratives and we make we, we examine those and we see okay where are the problems and then we make adjustments we can then start to be more aware of these triggers and work around them. So that was the long answer to a very short question about dealing with triggers. Uh, and I'm sorry that it's it's a bit general there, but I mean, this as I, as I hope that you guys are realizing, a lot of these questions are not, there isn't like a simple answer to these things. Um, you know, it might be a simple question about triggers or about how do you, um, you know, deal with a cold, distant spouse. But there's so many factors, there's so many complications that might come into it. And this is why it's really important for people to, um, you know, seek some outside help. I mean, this is this is the sort of thing that I I deal with every every single day. It's I talk about marriage problems and relationship problems. Um, and this is after, this is coming from years and years of my own personal research of working in, in the, the field. Uh, you know, <laughs> I'm now approaching what 13 years working in the, uh, the field and, you know, six years focusing on marriages and it's, it's, they're complicated subjects. So anyways, we'll keep going with, with questions here. Uh, Let's see. I think we've covered things of how do you get warmth if that person doesn't want to work on the relationship. Oh no, actually we'll cover that one. How do you work? How do you get warmth from a relationship if that person does not want to work 
on the relationship? Once again, a simple question. I'm going to make some assumptions here. I'm going to assume that the spouse who does not want to work on that relationship is starting to talk about separation or divorce so that we don't have any motivation towards fixing the relationship. Uh, and so we're trying to develop some amount of connection or warmth from a situation where the spouse is pulling away and actively perhaps moving towards ending the relationship. Um, I, I really like, uh, I'm going to come at this from a, a few different theoretical approaches. Uh, I do like uh, Gottman's kind of idea. He talks about when there's been breaks in, in a relationship, he likes going through a few different phases. He talks about a tone, a to and attach. Now he, he talks about these things in context of dealing with affairs. A tone being you know, fixing problems, a tune being, you know, really trying to figure out how the, the relationship works and attach is reintroducing a lot of that connection and warmth. Um, you know, coming from a, a slightly different angle, uh, I'm guessing that there is a lack of warmth or that there is a, a lack of desire to work on the relationship because there are probably some active points of pain that are going on. Perhaps there's a lot of tension. Perhaps there are big arguments. Perhaps the spouse who's pulling away is feeling attacked. And you can't have that warmth if you don't eliminate those problems. Uh, much like what Gottman is talking about with that atone phase. We have to remove active points of pain. I'm gonna reference Gottman again. Gottman talks about the magic ratio for um, having a healthy foundation for a relationship. It's, he talks about how there needs to be a five to one ratio of positive interactions to negative interactions. And this is why it's really important to uh, eliminate sources of pain. If you are frequently having arguments or if there's a lot of tension, that ratio gets reversed and you have a, a very unstable uh, relationship or if, <laughs> unstable would be a kind word to describe that situation. Uh, so, you know, first you have to eliminate problems and then, you know, there has to be, you know, I would say uh, after that, you actually have to have a reason to approach the relationship again. You have to find motivation there. Uh, quite frequently, we can approach it with some smaller issues, wanting to at least reduce tension or wanting to have better communication, uh, wanting to be able to be around each other. and. You know, a lot of these um, goals lie on a spectrum. So we start working on the, the smaller things, and then as we resolve those, we can move a little bit further down the spectrum. Uh, a very real example of something like this. Um, I had a, a client who, whose spouse did not, you know, was actively working towards divorce. Um, one of the big deals with this was that um, the spouse who was pulling away, my client's wife, was claiming that my client had uh, some big anger issues. Uh, so we had to actually address those anger issues. The my client had, um, you know, started reading books, started addressing anger, and started to approach the the relationship in a much more calm manner. So then we had to overcome some fear that, okay, the, the changes were just temporary. His wife recognized that he had made changes, um, but feared that if she were to re-engage or to connect with him, that he would just go back to the way things were. Uh, so we had to provide some stability, some hope, some trust, some reassurance. Uh, and from there, um, we still had hesitations and it was is a big process but if i had to break it down we have to eliminate problems we have to you know much like my client had to do here uh really provide a lot of reassurance and we have to you know work towards some smaller goals of connection first and that's where you would probably start with building rebuilding warmth all right i'm looking through the list um, 
Okay, I'm going to go back to. <laughs> I'm seeing a lot of a lot of big long comments. Um, I have. I'm going to answer one more question, and then uh, I want to talk about something else that's important here. Uh, Jennifer asks, "How do I get my husband to see that I'm making changes when we are separated and we don't see each other, but maybe once a month?" It's a problem. <laughs> uh, I imagine in this situation, Jennifer's husband um, probably would be unwilling to increase that communication or that um, that connection. You know, probably using the argument of "you haven't changed," it becomes really hard to demonstrate that change there. Um, and so, it really it, it does depend a little bit on what Jennifer's husband's goals are. Uh, for instance, if he does not want any communication, if he really is pushing really hard for divorce, um, that becomes really difficult to really make any sort of compromise here and suggest maybe perhaps more more interaction. I, you know, I'm going to assume that that's the case rather than Jennifer's husband wanting things to work out, but is a bit hesitant. So we're gonna go under the assumption the husband is saying I they're they're done. Um, and we are now at a point where Jennifer has made changes, has actually made real changes, and is just looking to to demonstrate this. Uh, a big I come up with this question a, a lot, or I, I hear this question a lot. You know, especially with certain things that are they're attempting to prove, like if the problem in the marriage was uh, a lack of connection, a lack of love, a lack of spark. Well, how do you prove that you're ready to have that spark if your spouse isn't really willing to, you know, to interact with you much at all? One thing I really like to do is I like to boil down. Um, the changes into something very basic. So let's take an example of needing to prove that there is warmth or connection or romance, but your spouse doesn't want romance. When I boil that down, what, why that is important, a lot of times that romance is about, you know, positive interactions, positivity. It's about lightness. It's about having a fondness for each other or an appreciation for each other. We can break it down into different pieces here. So like, for instance, um, you know, when you first start uh, in a new relationship, you might notice some, uh, some, of, the, some of those low level uh, bits of connection there. There's some fondness and appreciation, a light amount of flirting or something. But when we break it down, um, there are pieces that we can insert into conversations and interactions. Uh, so a very specific example for this, uh, you know, I, I have a training that kind of deals with building appreciation and fondness um, in part of our, in one of our courses. So in that, um, I have very specific suggestions about, um, you know, things to say to build up some of that, that fondness. The whole reason that I, you know, part of the, the, this training exists is to be able to insert some pieces of that connection and fondness into, into situations where your spouse is a bit more closed off. Uh, but this is what I would be doing. You know, you look at, okay, what does my spouse want changed? If you're looking to actually demonstrate that, and that's the only thing that we're trying to do with <laughs> this question here, uh, if we're trying to demonstrate it, I would break it down into smaller pieces and see if you can insert some of those pieces very clearly into other situations. Uh, let's pretend it's something else, more concrete like drinking. Okay, a, a drinking problem, and your spouse wants you to stop drinking. How do you demonstrate that you're actually not drinking anymore? Well, we could break that problem down into other things like 
uh, it was a problem with drinking because the person wasn't being honest or open or they weren't being responsible or taking care of the kids. Um, we can still insert pieces of that into the interactions, you know, and this is why, you know, within our, our trainings and within our path course specifically, I, I talk about um, a concept called home messages, you know, messages that you come back to frequently. And this is what would be needed in these, these cases. You know, very specific messages that you come back to frequently and are able to demonstrate even in brief interactions that you might have. I, uh, of course, this is just one facet of this problem. And there's other pieces to it as well uh, that would need to be addressed, but that would be at least how you might be able to demonstrate it. So, I. <laughs> uh, with all of you, you know, I'm going to be honest. I'm a bit overwhelmed by the response. I, you know, I, honestly, I have a list of say 20 more questions even in my my list here. I'm looking at all of you guys, and I can see that you're desperate. You want some answers. You want some help. Um, and you know, I, I I wish I had more time for all of you. I do, however, feel like there is um, some things that can be done. We do have um, our course, of course. I, I, I've referenced it many times during during this discussion, and we um, I, I do you know think that a lot of things here um, can be answered by going through some of the our, our course work. Uh, if if you're not sure that you have the kind of funds to invest in some personal attention from myself or some of my team. Um, I do think that I think that our, a lot of the content in our our coursework is is excellent. Um, a time and time again, we're getting feedback from from our clients saying how much the, the videos help, how much the suggestions help, uh, and I I can't even remember the last time that there was complaints over the, the you know the content that we have. Um, you know I I am. I, I do try to be very mindful about what the needs of uh, my, the community is and what kind of things that, um, what kind of questions that you all have. And I try to be very mindful about making sure that a lot of the, the content covers these sort of things. So if, if you are really looking for that help and I wasn't able to get to your um, question today or you need a little bit like of a different angle from some of these questions, I highly suggest that you um, that you you go into um, you, you, you go into our course here and check that out. Um, this is uh, absolutely some gold material. It's a good, easy entry point, and you know a way for you to really just kind of check out if what we have to say is actually helpful to you. Uh, I'm getting an error here due to Facebook restrictions. We can't see the names of profile. Hold on. I am trying to post the link. I might have to come back at, at the end. I'm not sure. Uh, I'm gonna. I might have to comment it um, at the end. For some reason, I I have a problem with technology. Sometimes it won't let me post the link here right now. So I'm going to actually go into the Thriving Marriage Facebook group. I'm going to get into this broadcast. We will, yeah, there we go. I can get the, there. If you go and look at the, um, at the, the, the stream now, you should see a link to join the course. Hope you all can uh, get some use out of that. Uh, and I hope you all got some, uh, got some insight into how you might approach some of your marriage problems today with this. Uh, if you would like this to be a regular part of our podcast um, or part of our, you know, our weekly you know, discussions here, uh, let us know. Um, you know, we, Heather and I really are open to feedback from all of you. So if you want us to answer more questions on a regular basis, please give us some feedback there in the, the comments. Uh, and we'd be happy to, to help out more. Thanks for listening to The Thriving Marriage, your A to Z blueprint for not just surviving marriage, but thriving. Until next time, my friends, thrive on.